purple rope here, and welcome to this short story entitled Good Luck. Enjoy. Mr. Finkelman had been quite candid in the interview. He'd looked at Joe rather seriously for a moment before admitting, We really have no idea how it works. His somber disposition broke into a winning smile that could easily clinch any sales pitch and certainly sold Joe. He added, But it sure as hell does. The Genmar implant, so named after Victor Jenny and Randolph Philip Marchenko, the two scientists who discovered it, was in its initial testing phase when Joe had his installed all those years ago. In fact, he was touted as lucky number seven in the papers when the story had first broken, since he was literally the seventh person in the world to acquire one. Everything had been hush-hush and cloaked in CIA-like secrecy before lucky number nine had drunkenly spilt it all to a prostitute in Vegas one fateful evening. The press went wild. All records had been made public, and the exact order of the surgical procedures had become a legend. But that was way later. When Joe had come to on the gurney at the makeshift medical facility in a seedy area of downtown Los Angeles, he had no idea there would be such a fuss over all this. His thoughts were consumed by the $140 that would be paid out to him in cash, as well as the $50 a week for the next five years he would receive while under surveillance by Sherwood Driscoll, the pharmaceutical company in charge of the project. Sure, he would have to make himself available to them for regular visits for this extended period of time, but for a guy as down on his luck financially as Joe, it was a sacrifice worth making, even for the pittance offered. Joe had done work as a guinea pig before. He figured for such a long commitment, the salary would be much higher. However, due to the particular nature of the experiment, Sherwood Drisco felt paying its lab rats would be somewhat redundant. It was all explained when he signed the paperwork. Joe would certainly agree. Eventually. But when he woke on the gurney, he didn't. Then, he was bitching and moaning despite being fortunate enough to land the gig in the first place. Things had been bad. They'd been bad for a long time. It had come down to taking the 200 a month, or moving back to Boise. And moving back to Boise wasn't an option. There were banks of computers in the observation room where the patients were funneled after surgery to regain their strength and collect the $140, which was promised. Joe had found out later that there had been 12 in that first group, making 14 with Jenny and Marshenko. Oh yes, they'd experimented on themselves first. No one knows whatever happened to them. They disappeared years ago, when it was discovered that the surgery was non-reversible. Still, he'd only seen three others in the observation room, two who had been released prior, and one that had entered before he'd exited the premises. The monitors showed computer games and the fat guy who had introduced himself as Frankie to anyone with an airshot and the bald guy were both playing poker. Joe was not interested. He laughed to himself. Come on, he thought. How could he trust that they weren't rigged? No, he just wanted his cash, and then it was pound the pavements to try to land the steady employment that had been eluding him for nearly two years. They can't rig that. Or could they? For a while, Joe was sure Sherwood Drisco had a hand in everything he was doing. He did fill out their little questionnaire, didn't he? They knew a heck of a lot about his life. There was a stack of three quarters on the sidewalk near the medical facility. As if someone left them there on purpose barely three steps from the beat-up jalopy that got Joe around the city. Three quarters. Anything less, and he might not have even bothered picking them up, but three, well, they would pay for a load of laundry at Washerworld. Coincidence? Had the girl in the white lab coat who'd collected his clipboard placed it there while he'd been under the knife? Maybe. Well, he had five years to figure it out. Could they keep this up for five years? Joe doubted it. On the way home, he stopped at the diner near his shack of an apartment in the slums. He hadn't eaten anything that he hadn't prepared himself, or that didn't come in a wrapper since last Christmas. It was stupid to spend some of the money he'd just been handed on food when there was stuff to eat at home but Joe couldn't seem to help himself. The scents and the greasy spoon were intoxicating, and soon the biggest burger on the menu was being carried across the dining room toward him. It never made it. The waiter tripped, and what was in one moment a scrumptious experience waiting to happen was in the next a mess all over his shirt and pants. Huh, good luck, right. And then the manager, who'd been tending the register nearby, exploded. God damn it, Reggie! That's it, you fired! 
Chuck! The waiter stopped helping Joe clean up and faced his boss, his ex-boss. It was an accident. I'm sorry. Sorry doesn't cut it anymore. Reggie Cutler, you are the worst waiter I've ever seen. I should have fired you a month ago. You're costing me more money than you're worth. Chuck, I really need this job. Reggie was practically in tears. No, you're fired. Now get your stuff and leave, or I'll call the police and have you removed. Reggie could see that Chuck meant business, and so, crestfallen, he stripped off his apron and disappeared behind the kitchen doors. A moment later, with his personals in tow, he left the diner for good. I'm so sorry, mister, said Chuck. Let me have your order again, and I'll have it remade. It's on the house. So maybe he was lucky after all, thought Joe. Lunch would cost him only the trip to the laundromat, and actually, since he'd found enough change to pay for the wash, it would really only cost the price of the dryer. Maybe, continued Joe in this vein, he could try pushing his luck and see what might happen next. Gee, thanks. Say, I suppose this is sort of awkward, but are you looking to hire a waiter? What's that? Chuck was cleaning the remnants of the mess off the table and into a bus pan. Well, I'm looking for a job, Joe stated simply. And if you happen to need a waiter... You got experience waiting tables? Ten years, Joe lied. Well, I got five shifts for you to cover this week. If I like what I see, you'll go on the schedule permanently. And if not... Chuck let it linger. It was more than fine by Joe. Okay, then. Be here tomorrow at noon. Could Sherwood Drisco have set up this entire event? It was conceivable, but it didn't seem likely to Joe. Yet that thought kept racing through his head. However, what didn't run through Joe's head, nor through the heads of his caseworkers at Sherwood Drisco, when he made his monthly reports on the progress with the Genmar implant, was Reggie Cutler. What everyone failed to recognize as events unfolded was just how important the Reggie Cutlers of the world were to the equation. The Genmar implant, quite literally, harnessed good luck. As Mr. Finkelman previously stated, no one was quite sure how it worked, not even the scientists who had created it. What they did uncover, though, through research, was that the tiny fabricated disc worked best when implanted in between the vertebrae in the spine. Once there, it somehow manipulated the telluric waves around its occupant, shielding him, or her, from unfortunate consequences in all manner, while drawing toward it only beneficial ones. What no one took into account was that for every sudden job opening for lucky number seven, there was a Reggie Cutler getting fired. It seems there is only so much luck out there, and the old adage that every action has an equal and opposite reaction is especially true in the world of chance. When only fourteen people are sucking on the straw of happenstance, it makes almost imperceptible wrinkles on the telluric currents. When, in the fourth year of testing lucky number nine, let the cat out of the bag after cleaning up on the roulette table, the consequences changed mightily. With tremendous pressure from multiple avenues laid upon them, the FDA rushed the Genmar implant through its final year of testing in under two months. By the end of the first year on the market, over six million had been installed in American citizens alone. It didn't take long for the stats to pile up. For example, the year before the Genmar explosion, the crude world mortality rate, according to the CIA World Factbook, was 8.3752 per thousand people. That first year it didn't change too much, as it's listed now at 8.3753 per thousand people. However, of those approximately 8.5 per thousand people who died, only 0 .039 had the Genmar implant. Numbers were skewed like that across the board. For a mere $10,000, one could infinitely decrease one's chances of dying. Sure, it's a lot of money, but would you rather put a down payment on a new car? or assure yourself of a longer life. A longer life, mind you, that would be luckier in all sorts of ways. Most likely, you'd luck into a new car for free along the way anyways, so the choice became much easier. By the third year of availability, the discs were being implanted in newborns at birth. By the fifth year, there were more people with them than without them, and it was at that exact moment when that single person who represented 50.0000000001% of the population had his Genmar installed 
that critical mass was achieved. Suddenly, there was just as much good luck in the world as bad, and things got flaky. Life became a huge pinball machine. People with Genmars became kickers, or those little bumpers that flicker the pinball away at tremendous speed and crazy angles. Those without the devices were more like slingshots, or those little tunnels the pinballs enter. As the scoreboard lights up, the force behind the ball becomes greater and greater until it's shot back into the field with enormous magnitude. When people with Genmars came in contact with one another, luck would begin bouncing off of them faster and faster until, well, until someone's luck eventually ran out, usually with dire consequences, oftentimes leading to death. Whereas, if an unfortunate without an implant was in close proximity with the Genmar, he or she became a slingshot, hoarding the bad luck being thrown at him from the device. Oftentimes, if two or more Genmars ganged up on someone without, it was unusual for that poor fellow to spontaneously combust. The mortality rate on Earth skyrocketed beyond anything ever imagined. War, plague, disease, nuclear holocaust... These were nothing beside the Genmar epidemic. It didn't take long for people to want their implants removed. It was immediately discovered that within hours of installation, the discs fused permanently to the spine. That was when Jenny and Marshenko disappeared. Joe decided early on to hide out. If he stayed far enough away from people, he discovered he could control his luck somewhat. He'd made a considerable amount of money in the years when he was one of the few lucky people in the world, and with this he purchased an island in the Aleutian chain off the coast of the Alaskan mainland. He lived simply enough, with loneliness being his greatest enemy. Still, he dared not allow anyone to join him in his seclusion. He kept his own livestock and tended his own farm, which would keep him sustained indefinitely. Every once in a while, he would discover that he was missing some necessity of life. Luckily, he still had his genmar. At one point, a plane crashed near his property. The occupants died and the aircraft was destroyed, but it just so happened that certain things Joe needed were on board and undamaged. Things like this happened from time to time. Joe guessed he could live comfortably like this until the population of those with Genmar implants dwindled to a more manageable number. If he was lucky. And if it's one thing that he was, it was lucky. I hope you liked that story, and if you did, click like, uh, share it, subscribe to my YouTube channel, put a comment down whether you liked it or not. It helps with my algorithm, and it's much appreciated.